Um, hello and welcome to the latest discussion in the video game uh, history series at Columbus State University in Columbus, Georgia. My name is Dr. Ryan Lynch, Associate Professor of History, and on behalf of the Department of History and Geography at Columbus State University, we are proud to digitally welcome the co-directors of the Video Game History Foundation, Kelsey Lewin and Frank Cifaldi, to discuss Hi. the work of the VGHF and the digital preservation of video games and video game culture more generally. While I will let Kelsey and Frank speak to most of the specifics of the Video Game History Foundation and their work today, Frank founded the VGHF in 2017 as a nonprofit organization, quote, dedicated to preserving, celebrating, and teaching the history of video games. Together, Frank, Kelsey, and a team of devoted staff, much of whom are volunteers or have other careers aside from their VGHF work, are working to preserve the history of a medium which has only exploded in popularity and sales over the past several years and are among the few dedicated organizations with this goal in mind. Today, they will pre present on the work of the VGHF and the challenges they face. They will answer several pre-selected questions written by some of my history and video games class students this semester. And then there will be a brief opportunity for attendees to ask their own questions in the chat box on this platform. Please join me in giving a warm Georgia welcome to Kelsey and Frank. Hello. Hi. Thank you guys so much for having us. Um, and uh, I can't I can't see anyone or chat or anything right now. I can only see our uh, our screen right here. So um, we will try to keep this, I don't know, breezy. Not We won't fly through it, but um, I assume you guys are going to have a lot of awesome questions. So I think we'll try to um, kind of get through this talk and um, and take questions, right? Yeah, and then just to just sort of add to the preamble here, um, you know, you're looking at sort of the title of the stack right now. We like to do this first because video game preservation is such a tenuous term and it means so many things to so many different people that um, what we like to do is sort of explain our place in the world as we see it. Um, and that I, I would hope sort of informs uh, the discussion that comes after it. So. Um, Let's take it away, Kelsey. Cool. So, um, as Ryan already uh, uh, mentioned, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving, celebrating, teaching the history of video games. That's right here is our library. It is in Emeryville, California, um, and it's you know it's it is a slice of what we do. It's a you know we're we're a small organization right now, so this is a uh, I don't know a, a good demo kind of thing uh, for all of the things that we do. Um, we usually start with this question, but why does preserving video game history matter? But um, I think you guys probably get that already. I think I don't think we need to convince you guys that preserving video game history is important or that it's a part of our culture. So let's move on to what Frank was talking about, which is what is preserving video game history even mean? Um, and I think when most people start thinking about this, um, the kind of the first thing they think of is like, okay, let's make sure we have all of the games, right? Um, just every single game on a shelf. Um, but you got to be able to play them as well. So, you know, every single console hooked up and on the shelf. And what about arcade games? You have a, a nice like airplane hanger to store all of these in and um, make sure the maintenance on those is all running and oh gosh what about digital games and um, uh, cell phone games and <laughs> all of that stuff so um, we actually don't do that here at the video game history foundation we don't collect games uh, at all or retail video games at all um, and you know we'll get into kind of why in a minute here but um, you know, this is something that uh, we think of as just one part of video game history and just one part of video game uh, preservation. So what do you get from having the game itself? You get you get some important things. You know, if you have a physical copy of a game in your hands, um, you get, you know, what it, what it looked like, what it sounded like, um, how it plays, how it was packaged, you know, the cover, the manual, all of that stuff. Um, but if you were to, you know, try to write a book about a video game, or you were try, uh, going to write an article or do a documentary or something like that, is that is that physical game 
enough to do all of that. You know, you, you won't get how it was marketed. You won't get how it was received at the time. You know, how was it developed? Who worked on it? Um, why was the game made? All of that good stuff. Uh, Frank, I feel like I'm uh, not being able to see you here. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm not letting you I'm waiting for you to breathe so I can jump in. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So, yeah. Um, you know, so uh, the point we're kind of getting at is that uh, when we talk about video game preservation, we're, we're not terribly interested at the foundation specifically um, on collecting games that were sold to people. Um, we'll get into this more later, but sort of the, the the point is that we don't feel that reinventing the wheel is all of, all that interesting. Um, a lot of private collectors are collecting physical video games. A lot of digital preservationists are are um, collecting, you know, even digital games or making digital representations of retail games. Uh, the work's already being done, and there's only so much time in the day and so much funding, frankly, that we have that we decided to sort of find our niche. And um, and again, you know, other people are trying this. So our favorite example of let's collect all the games. Um, there is an organization called the Embracer Group. It's a commercial organization, not a nonprofit. Um, they have started a video game archive where they are attempting to collect every physical game ever made. Uh, so far, there's 60,000 of them, and that's cost them $2 million. And, uh, well, let's see, MobyGames.com on the right here, go back, please, um, currently shows there's a, about 150,000 video games out there in the database. So uh, doing the math real quick, that would cost us, what, oh, uh, a little over $5 million. We, uh, we don't have $5 million. Or uh, the space to, for that. Or the or... space. <laughs> <laughs> so point is just not 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 uh, not not really a focus of ours um, and then as kind of mentioned earlier well okay maybe we should digitize all games right instead of just collecting physical maybe we should make a digital repository um, what's the issue with that Kelsey um, well, as you can see, there's kind of a lot of people already doing that. You know, there's there's a lot of organizations that we already work with, mostly, um, you know, community organizations. Like they're not, it's not being done necessarily by like museums and archives and stuff, but uh, citizen archivists, and they're doing a really great job. I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of people have heard of um, Hidden Palace. They do a lot of uh, ROM releases of like unreleased games and that sort of things. Um, so we, although we do sometimes dump ROMs, this is a real photo of, of Frank in the, uh, in the wild. I guess. So many uh, of our photos are like very, very staged, but that's me actually at a retired game industry person's house <laughs> dumping their prototypes. It's a real action <laughs> shot. A real action shot. <laughs> um, so while we work with all of these people fairly often, um, it's just not where our strengths are, our best, uh, you know, put. So we think um, as historians here, you know, you need more than just the games to research history. Um, we need to understand how they were made, why they were made, um, and how they were played, you know, how people kind of reacted to them and um, and talked about them and stuff. Um, and that's I guess, kind I of guess the a short version of that, if I can real quick, is that, yeah, absolutely. you know, we, what we identified as historians who've been doing this work, you know, collectively anyway, for decades, um, is that historians generally aren't lacking in access to playing video game history. What they are lacking is understanding where those games came from and and um, why they were made and stuff like that. And so that that's been our focus. So when we talk about how games were made, we are mostly talking about uh, the game's development and you know the people involved in that. So that can be things. That, um, these photos here are, uh, this is a photo of uh, the DMA designs team that worked on the original Grand Theft Auto, um, as well as some original art from the first Grand Theft Auto. Um, so, you know, we're talking about sometimes things like artwork, um, sometimes things like prototypes and betas, you know, early releases of games, um, original art and documentation and that sort of thing that I went, went into it, but also things like the tools used to mm -hmm. actually create these games, um, the source code, the, the pieces that actually went in into you know into the making of it um, and how it was all compiled so um, uh, where am I going with this uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the uh, the development side of it um, and something that I think especially in the game industry is very 
uh, can tend to be very closed off and, and not um, shared around very much. This isn't something, you know, these were these photos here um, of the this team and of the art um, was just something sent in a press kit before anyone knew what uh, Grand Theft Auto was eventually going to become. So these were things that, um, you know, I would not be surprised if the actual studios themselves no longer had uh, and just hadn't really, you know, no magazine ran these photos or anything because what was Grand Theft Auto? Who cared? Um, that first one was not the one that uh, <laughs> that got super popular. Um, why is this not working? There we go. Uh, and then when we talk about how games were played, you know, we're kind of talking about how the world, what the world does with the game. So it's it's not just playing the game itself, but it's also things like discussion about the game, articles, reviews, you know, uh, magazine coverage of things, um, the fan communities around games. Um, when I originally made this slide, I don't know if anyone remembers the uh, uh, near thing that was going on where there was like a mysterious door in a mysterious room um, and there were kind of rumors all around it and no one could no one could find it in their copy of the game and it turned out to just be a very very elaborate fan modification but you know that kind of became part of the lore of that game and part of the the discussion around that game um, you know it's a speculation rumors about things um, you know Mew under the truck in Pokemon uh, marketing and advertisements, press releases, uh, just whatever the marketing of a game, like what did they want you to know about that game? What did they want the, the world to think about it um, and promotions and that sort of thing? You know, the, these are all part of the story of a game. Um, so it's just, you know, some, some uh, examples of that, like magazine articles and fan things. And this is a, this is a press release for a Wonderswan game because I'm a big Wonderswan fan, so had to throw that in there. Um, Frank, is there anything you wanted to add before I... No, I mean, I, the point is that, you know, what we identified is that we're in service to those telling the stories of video game history. And so the kind of material we collect is, is, is centered around context, not gameplay, typically. Um, and so, you know, going back to those earlier examples, even like the Grand Theft Auto pictures and, and and sketches and things like that. I mean, these were things that we actually provided to a documentarian who was doing a documentary on the making of Grand Theft Auto. And these are things that he couldn't get by talking to Rockstar. Uh, first of all, because they probably didn't even reply to him. But even if they did reply <laughs> to him, um, they probably don't just have this stuff easily accessible. And as Kelsey said, you know, in our archive where we collect things like press material, we uncovered this photograph or like the thing on the upper right actually in this in that slide is um one of the tools used in the making of disney's aladdin on the sega genesis and that's something that um we were able to provide um actually back to disney for a, for a commercial product when they uh, re-released aladdin so um so yeah so where are we going back to to um yeah past this so you know if i can kind of start on the next slide um yeah what we tend to think, you know, when, when we're looking around at how history is told is that uh, maybe people are kind of bad at, at, at video game history. But I think another way of framing that, and I really hope this next slide is what I think it is. No, it's not. Okay, we'll get back to that. Not. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, we, I just wanted to provide a few little examples yeah. of, of ways in which people have historically been not great video game historians. Um, the funniest of which is when Jeopardy ran this... Uh, uh, very strange question um that these seven rotatable blocks used in this video game have names like orange ricky hero and smash boy that comes all from they had a... to do, it was it was an internet meme and all they had to do was consult an actual manual but where are you going to do that right where are <laughs> jeopardy's uh fact checkers going to find the manual for tetris to realize oh that was just a funny photoshop you know it's, it's hard to do right um, or that the inventor of the Game Boy, uh, Gunpei Akoi, which, you know, it, first of all, nothing has a singular inventor most of the time, which is definitely the case there, but, um, you know, it is incorrectly said to be a janitor at Nintendo. And uh, no, he was, he went to school for electrical engineering. He was a, he was a mechanical and electrical engineer and he was hired as such, you know, he was, he was not um, by any stretch of the imagination a janitor, but, but these are, these things are hard to fact check. They are they are hard to 
find you know contemporary and, and, and primary sources for a lot of this information um there's a very popular video game history book that um has a lot of uh, a lot of inaccuracies in it um and they get they get repeated over and over and over again um so it, it's not so much that people are bad video game historians it's that it's really hard right now to get good accurate information to get primary sources about video games yeah um so this is a really good example on the ne on the next slide here um so where, where are you going to learn about video games uh in terms of like digging up contemporary material we really like magazines um so let's just pretend that we're an average researcher who wants to sort of know about the state of video games in the early 80s. Um, this was a fairly popular uh, magazine at the time, Video Gaming Illustrated. Um, let's go to WorldCat. Let's search around the country for every library that has holdings of this magazine. Oh, there's exactly two. <laughs> One of them is is uh, the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester. The other is uh, Michigan State. And by the way, next slide. Um, if we go to Michigan State, they just have two random uh, issues out of the 16 or so, meaning that one library in the country um, theoretically has a full run of this magazine. Um, so uh, next slide. So the, the the solution seems to be like, well, internet scans, right? Like fans have gotten together and, and scanned every issue uh, of this magazine um, and uploaded it to the internet archive. But that's just there for now. We don't know if that's forever. The thing is with the Internet Archive, um, here's an example. Replay Magazine is a is a coin op trade magazine, meaning they cover arcade games temporary uh, for the most part. So arcade amusement, we should say, not just video games. Um, really, really fantastic resource for understanding the coin op industry. Uh, was on the Internet Archive, no longer on the Internet Archive um, because that publication is still in print. Um, and the rights holders uh, ask for a takedown. They are taken down. They're basically decimated from the internet at this point, unless you know the weird places to look. We don't think historians should have to look at the weird places. And by the way, yeah. back to WorldCat with Replay. Oh, this looks familiar. The Strong Museum of Play and theoretically the Library of Congress, though uh, uh, even then. Once again, a <laughs> few issues. <laughs> right. Uh, but this magazine started in 75 and is still going to this day. Uh, the Library of Congress's holdings are from 96 to 2001, not exactly the golden age of arcades. So that's just magazines. Magazines are, you know, we like to say a really good resource because they're a good time capsule of video game history. You know, you not only get like if you're covering a certain game, you might get a review about that game, but like what else were people talking about in that era? You know, it's a good resource, but um, you know, that's not the only things. We just showed a lot of other stuff. So what about all of this stuff, all of the concept art and the photos and all of that? This is um, source code from uh, the game Starflight. Uh, which we have in our archive as well. This is um, this is some uh, Atari, uh, like, like a library of Atari things and, and when they were released. I mean, um, there's a lot of things that are just not held in libraries whatsoever um, and just not really collected. You know, we're, we're one of the first libraries to be um, collecting these kinds of materials at all. Um, and the only one whose only focus is video games. Um, so, okay, this is obviously a pretty big problem that there's no like good place to go to research all of this. So, what the heck are we doing about it? Um, we're doing a lot of things, but we're gonna we're gonna talk about six of them very quickly. I love listicles. Yeah. So the first one is is the obvious one. It, it's our archive in in California. Um, we do have we've got over ten thousand uh, magazines in this archive. Uh, that's just the English language stuff. We have more holdings than we can actually fit into this room. That including the full run of Video Gaming Illustrated. Don't worry, yeah. folks. It's in there. We're just not yep. in WorldCat yet. <laughs> um, you know, so we we have more than we can physically fit into this archive, but we are keeping all of this stuff because um, even though we do digitize stuff, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, there's no such thing as a perfect scan, and it's always good to be redundant. That's a kind of a a pillar of preservation is redundancy. Um, and uh, there's a really nice Bubsy shrine there that I feel like everyone can appreciate. <laughs> I hope I, I know everyone's young here for the most part, but uh, if you don't know Bubsy, look up Bubsy. He's a good uh, butt for your jokes. Um, yes. Thing number two, 
Uh, lost and endangered media. So we, we kind of said earlier that we don't tend to focus on preserving uh, playable games themselves. Um, there are some exceptions to that. We absolutely uh, do go after things like games that never actually made it out, right? Things that were worked on but never finished or maybe were even finished but never sold, um, sort of rough draft versions of games or even the the, uh, the the source material that went into the games. Um, I'm going to go through just because of time constraints very quickly on the examples here because they're all awesome. Um, upper middle is actually a floppy disk donated to us uh, by someone who used to work at Nintendo and, and localized the script for the RPG Earthbound, which is a cult classic. Um, he had his original scripting files. He donated this disk. We extracted the data. It turned out there was all kinds of really, really interesting material to to glean uh, from the source scripts that you don't get from the game, such as like what some of the characters' names were, just like seemingly innocuous things like that that blow fans' minds. Uh, bottom middle was a disk from the deceased developer of an arcade game um, that was actually a Major League Baseball sequel to NBA Jam, one of the most popular arcade games ever made. Um, this baseball game was developed and they, and they sort of test marketed it. They made like 10 cabinets or something, put them out, failed spectacularly to cancel the project. And this disc that was, was just sitting in this guy's basement for decades is like the only surviving remnant of it. We actually built the game from his source and got it running again. It's, it's now in MAME, if you guys use MAME. Um, on the right is an unreleased uh, Nintendo 64 game, sort of a spinoff of SimCity and the Sims, that sort of franchise, uh, SimCopter. Uh, this was a demo at E3 for a game that was never commercially released. Um, and But someone who worked on the game uh, had kept this cartridge that they actually used at the kiosks at E3 um, and uh, sent it to us when he saw what we were doing. And then finally on the left, I think is my favorite thing in this in this grouping, which is um, Sega on, on the left here is a photograph of it, uh, had a VR helmet in 1994, which is not a good year to try to introduce <laughs> uh, virtual reality. Um, they they had some software written for it. They they had announced it. They had shown it, and they just never shipped the thing. Uh, however, we had the actual source code for one of the games developed for it, and uh, using that code, uh, Rich Whitehouse, one of our engineers on the right here, um, there was just enough clues in that code for him to figure out sort of how the helmet worked, even though we didn't have one because no one does. Um, and we actually recreated this. VR helmet that absolutely no one has just through digital archaeology looking at the code which which is which is uh something we're very very proud of Kelsey on it's up on it yeah it's up on github and you can play it on a vive if you if you want and rich actually he's got a version where he kind of fixed it so it doesn't mm -hmm. immediately make you sick too yeah it does I don't it's know not if you see those graphics in the background making there. you throw up yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's not great it's like a 15 frames a second or something like that's very it's very bad um the, another thing we do is uh we call it digging through basements but really it's you know reaching out to um or getting reached out to by people who uh have been in game development or in uh, the games media or something along those lines and, and have kept a lot of their stuff so um you know we've gone through uh, mostly developers in the chicago area because there's there's really like a few main hubs for video game history um, or for, you know, just kind of where the industry has been. Um, Chicago's the only one of those that has basements and doesn't cost a million dollars. So that's where the uh, people tend to keep things. So on the right here is us with Mike Mendheim. He worked on um, some games you guys might have heard of, like uh, the Mutant League football and hockey series, um, Army Men, uh, let's see what else, like Tasmania, um, a, a handful of things throughout his career, and he kept a lot of his design documents and that sort of thing, which is a really cool look at, you know, just the development of a game and, and how it came together. He he put together these extremely beautiful, detailed um, design documents that is not something that every game developer did, but it really gives you a, a super uh interesting look at exactly you know what's going into these games and and what the like philosophy behind some of the decisions and stuff are um the middle picture uh is maybe fairly obvious it's just a, a whole lot of uh prototype or you know early builds of games um we did cover those eprom windows if you know anything about these <laughs> these uh types of 
um, of media here. We did cover those so that the the data did not get wiped from it. But you know, this is these are like real boxes. This is the way some of this stuff really is stored in some people's basements because they're just they're just they're old game stuff. You know, a lot of people started in the game industry in their in their early twenties, and it was you know maybe in a time when they weren't they didn't understand that they were doing something that would be culturally relevant years and years later and so um you know we're very lucky that people hung on to this kind of stuff at all um well and just to top, put weight on this too like like that, this middle picture and, and as well as the one you're about to talk about um in both of these cases there were literally one-of-a-kind games in these boxes games that we that never shipped to retail uh, but were sent out for review to the media that we cannot substantiate another copy existing in the world because they just weren't kept because what they just moved on to the next project. So, I mean, you know, there's stories if, if anyone is is familiar with uh, the world of film of like entire movies being found in like basements and in, in, in Amsterdam and stuff like that, that like were thought to be lost. Like we're doing this right now with video games we're finding completely lost video games in basements of people who don't know that they even have them um and and you know i think it's a, it's a sort of a unique value proposition of what we're able to sort of bring to the world essentially by avoiding uh reinventing the wheel like we said and 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 and, and just finding you know the things that aren't being done uh, already yeah and i mean just to elaborate on that a little bit i mean um it's it's not something that i think everyone can do is just you know knock on a developer's door and be like let me in your basement you know that's not a that's not something that i think um it, it's something that i think we are uniquely positioned for you know um, frank has been in the game industry for a couple of decades at this point um i've been in and around the game industry between the two of us we have a lot of um you know we we've built a lot of trust and and kind of um, good standing with people who have been in this industry for a while. So it's not just, um, you know, let's put all the video games straight online. It's, you know, it's kind of working with each person um, in their, in, in meeting their needs where they're at. You know, I mean, a lot of these guys wouldn't necessarily know what to do with a box full of this. They wouldn't even necessarily know it's interesting. Um, the top left one there, um, that is us going through uh, Ed Semrad's basement. Uh, he was the editor in chief of Electronic Gaming Monthly for a, a while. Um, and uh, all of his, you know, there were unreleased games in there with just, you know, Super Mario Duck Hunt or whatever, like just very, very common stuff because to him, you know, there was no difference. Those were just his games. Those were just games he was sent. Um, and so, um, where am I going with this? Uh, you know, it sometimes takes someone who uh, can can explain to people like why this might be interesting and why, um, you know, why people would be really excited to see these things. Um, the other thing we do, obviously, uh, this one's not staged at all. At all. This, this does require uh, the entire Video Game History Foundation full-time staff to watch us very poorly scan something from CDI magazine on a flatbed scanner. That's uh, that's exactly how that works. But um, yeah, the, the point here is that, you know, we don't just collect these physical items. We also uh, recognize that historians, for the most part, are trying to access things remotely. So we are putting a lot of effort into digitizing. Kelsey, we really got to pick up the pace because we've got 15 minutes left. I thought it was I thought it was two hours. I'm so nope. sorry. OK. All right. Um, so the other thing we're doing is uh, teaching and celebrating history. We do a pop up museum at um, the Portland Retro Gaming Expo every year. Um, we have a podcast that we use to talk about historians and people from video game history about some of the stuff that they've they've done. Um, I wish I could spend more time talking about the Monkey Island one, but you should look it up on our website because we uh, uh, we did a an event with the creator of The Secret of Monkey Island and and dug through the source code of Monkey Island, and it's it's a very very interesting look if you're especially if you're interested in that game. Um, and then the last thing, this is a newer thing we're doing, um, which is working towards some copyright reform, because as a lot of people have uh, have mentioned, um, and in some of the comments we were getting before this is, you know, like, okay, well, how do we keep these things accessible when, you know, things like the eShop is shutting down and like what, you know, uh, piracy can't be the only answer, right? So um, something we are doing is working with the Software Preservation Network to try to expand um, 
what like archives and libraries and, and institutions are able to do with video games because the very short version is right now it's nearly impossible for libraries and archives to collect video games um, in any way other than like you know having a physical ps2 game on their shelves or whatever it's a it's a very very um, unfair process so we are we're working with the software preservation network to try to bring some reform to that um, just to summarize, you know, basically we're saving what still exists. We're cleaning out offices and going to people's uh, uh, basements and all of that stuff. And we're building an archive for it all, um, including a digital archive. Um, we're trying to advocate for a better future, which is like getting more libraries and people to um, start handling video game stuff because, you know, we're, we can't do it all. Um, we're fighting the outdated copyright laws um, and we are advocating for the commercial industry to um, to be a part of this too, because you know this is their own this is their own history we're talking about. Um, something we really like want to hammer home here is that no single institution or group can do it all. You know we have we have to have lots and lots of people because there's lots and lots of problems. You know we've we've identified kind of where we are best fit, but those are six things that are good. But there's probably like 500 things that actually need to be done. Um, you know, we think of it as an ecosystem where everyone has a role. Um, there are institutions, there's historians, there's collectors, students, everyone is doing something a little bit different. Um, cool, sorry, I had to kind of blow through the last of <laughs> I thought this was going much longer, but um, yeah. You're, you're, to just... you're okay, actually, uh, Kelsey, if uh, you don't mind me saying, you know, I don't, I want to be respectful, of course, of your and, and Frank's time, but we do have um, some time and we have quite a few questions that have been um, submitted, but um, Frank, if you need to dip out a little bit early. I don't, and, I just want to make sure we have time for these questions. So. Oh, we, yeah. we, we do. It really is okay. just, we're very appreciative of you giving us uh, your time. So, um, uh, thank you very much for what was, um, I mean, in general, just a, a really, really fascinating presentation. And I can see that, of course, by the many questions that we have uh, already received um, related to your talk. Um, and so what I'm going to do before I turn to some of the ones that have been submitted by our attendees today are to turn to um, some of the questions that I had solicited from our history and video games class um, this semester. And so I will jump into one of those right now. Um, the first question is, how much time does the Video Game History Foundation spend doing research on the background of games and other collectible items? And which games or material get priority when you have so much to cover? I mean, I think a short version of that is that um, a lot of what the reason that we're able to do as much as efficiently as we do is that uh, we kind of came pre-baked as naturally interested historians. You know what I mean? Like we, like it's not like we were um, librarians working in another field and sort of inherited a video game problem. We actually approached this as frustrated video game historians. So um, it's really easy for us to. I, I guess another way of saying it is, we we already kind of have an internal filter, uh, even if it might be a little bit biased and flawed because we're humans. Of of sort of what is immediately sort of interesting and of use to us, therefore other historians as well. Um, so we don't spend a lot of time sort of doing background research on 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 on, on what it is that we're collecting. That said, um, we do do a lot of research on actual publications because um, we have a sort of unique goal of we're trying to complete the set of video game periodicals, at least English language ones, right? So um, there, there is some research being done on our end into what publications exist, when, when the last issue was, you know, things that are just not very well documented when we're talking about a fairly obscure PC computer game magazine uh, from the early 90s. Um, and a lot of these, you know, sometimes you might be tempted to believe that it's fairly obvious because you know you uh, magazines typically come printed with like an issue number and stuff on them. Um, but this was a little bit of a renegade industry back then, and there are a lot of things that got sent to print completely wrong or without dates or in the wrong order. And um, you know we're trying to uh, correct the historical record on that a little bit too, as part of the as part of that. Yeah, and then you know the, the the last part of that question is what's the criteria in our collecting policy? Um, I, I don't know that we have a like very clearly defined one. One of the 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 
strengths and possibly one day weaknesses of, of our organization is that we are pretty small and tight knit. And so there's not there's not a lot of um, I don't want to use the term red tape, but like there's, there's not a lot of, you know, having to discuss things very thoroughly. We are, we're all kind of on the same page so far. Um, so really, the criteria tends to be, you know, actually, I'll answer this another way. When people ask us what we collect, we kind of the, the short version is, can you get it on eBay? Yeah, we don't care. You know, like, like, is it something that a person could <laughs> theoretically purchase? Great, let them purchase it. Like, we, like, if, if you if you recall very quickly, we went through a sort of like slide about how we believe game preservation is an ecosystem, and we believe private collectors are a part of that ecosystem. Private collectors are future donors, and so um, we kind of let the collectibles go with the collectors, and we sort of focus on collecting information uh, more than the things that people are already uh, going after. Thank you very much. Um, it's really fascinating. And you, you sort of addressed this in part in the presentation itself and maybe in your answer there as well, um, just at the end there, Frank. But uh, another question that I received from a student was, how does game preservation work when it comes to fan or community work like mods? Uh, does the Video Game History Foundation seek to preserve mods or other community creations to any extent? So yeah, the, the short answer is right now no. Uh, you are looking at two thirds of the staff of the foundation and we are, uh, you know, we have our focus that we kind of shared um, in this because basically because we kind of have to be. We have to be focused right now and we have to have, you know, um, realistic goals. Uh, we absolutely believe that fan made works and mods and all of that stuff is a is a very important part of video game history um but our strengths are are primarily as historians and as like context seekers um which means that we're not the best people equipped for like long-term preservation of uh digitally made like mod you know mod files to video games like that's not something that any of us have a um particularly deep knowledge of um or ability to do that so it's not it's not a project the short version is just it's not a project that we're doing right now um when we talk about the ecosystem you know i think there are so many places in which there's very little being done and that you know if that's something you're passionate about we really want to encourage more people to um just start on projects like that because you know we didn't we didn't start out as a nonprofit. We all started out as historians, just collecting this information for ourselves and, and sharing it amongst ourselves. Um, so I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Frank. But yeah, I would say that we're not actively collecting um, fan or mod work. We are actively interested in it. Um, I think that what what we're probably more equipped to do is. Um, slowly whittle away at figuring out how to create space for preserving things like fan mods because that is just not digital collections is still a, a, a new thing across any kind of library or archive and we're all sort of figuring it out as we go um and so you know i, I think our role is not um actually squirreling away the files right now it's more figuring out long term how does one actually collect and and catalog and and preserve these files um in a way that you know frankly doesn't get us in in uh legal trouble in some in some cases yeah and and sort of linked with that right and um, you did a very nice job in talking in the presentation and and then in your your question your response to the question earlier about not wanting to collect things that you can find on ebay right but what do we think about physical hardware right these very very rare electronics right and the physical space that um they need to take up in your archive and so this was another question we received from a student which was about storing that type of material how do you store old, delicate electronic hardware, right? The, the rarer stuff that you aren't finding on eBay. Do you just rely on, you know, simple climate controlled storage or is there something else? What considerations do game hard, does game hardware require that other types of archival material does not? So I, I want to answer that by answering it um, from the perspective of institutions that focus more on that than we do. Um, the, the one that comes to mind for me um, is the Strong Museum of Play, who we, we, we mentioned briefly in the presentation. Um, they 
they they they have collections very similar to ours, but they um, also deal in game hardware and software much much more than we do. Um, and the short answer is that you know they have at least one person who is dedicated to that. Um, they they have you know I forget his name. But there's there's like the arcade guy, right? There, there's someone who's sort of maintaining and upkeeping the hardware, and making sure it's climate controlled. But they also have um actual conservationists on staff um so between the two i think they're sort of handling things like how do we prevent damage to this hardware how do we prevent um capacitors from like blowing up and leaking and, and ruining the board and things like that um so th they also have someone who um does a random sampling of mm -hmm. uh the electronics to test them on it like there is a a regular testing of a random sampling of their electronics and and hardware and software as well so i mean it's it's an entire it's an entire production to keep all of that in really good shape um as far as our archive is concerned i mean obviously you know we mentioned that we don't we don't carry a lot of hardware or, um, you know, especially not retail games. There's a couple of um, kind of minor points about uh, things like prototype boards and stuff. Um, there are uh, the way that these uh, games are stored on these cartridges um, is basically there is a little window that um, makes the game you how how do I explain this in a in a simple way? Um, you can you can easily add new data or have the data data be erased um it is you know an erasable reprogrammable chip on there um if you have some data that is unique you want to make sure that it does not get erased from there so that's something that requires covering um, we put them in anti-static bags it is climate controlled i mean there's some there's some kind of basics there the, the, the biggest enemy to the stuff that we keep because we're like 90 percent paper and then like right. like kelsey mentioned Moisture. things like exposed uh 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 windows that can be erased um it's really uv like we 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 do everything we can to prevent uv from touching anything so there's no way for sunlight to get into our facility every light is led and they're only on when necessary even then because there's a non-zero amount of fading that can happen to paper it's you know over decades not months but um, but we were careful about it anyway. So, so UV and moisture are the two things that we prevented the, the most, but um, we're sort of fortunate in that we, for the most part, don't deal with complicated um, hardware. We, we find uh, better homes for that stuff instead. Great. Um, so I mentioned that you've got a bit of a unique audience today, um, Kelsey and Frank, right? And that you have a lot of professional historians and historians in training right now, right? And so this next question that we received from an attendee is, um, what do you see as the best way that we as historians can learn about the video games we study? Do you have any advice? My favorite way is just, we're not there yet, but this is what we're building. Um, my favorite way of learning about a game is having access to its actual source material and digging in and learning how to script it and learning how to build it and like tweaking it and seeing what happens and having access to its original design notes and documentation and stuff like that like that's our dream that's our long-term vision is that it's common for archives like ours um, and other libraries around the country, university archives, things like that, to collect video game source material so that someone who's very invested in learning how a game was made can uh, get inside the game itself and 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 see it. Um, we we breezed past this um, in the, in the presentation, but something that we did to demonstrate this was that I had access to. Um, the source code from Lucasfilm's uh, The Secret of Monkey Island, which happens to be my favorite game. Um, and so as an historian with access to something that I just know inside and out, front to back, um, I now understand the decisions that made that were made in the making of that game better than even theoretically possible by just playing it. You know, like having learned its scripting language, having gone in and like modified the game and built rooms and created animations and stuff like that. Like I now really, really understand that game and its and its engine and its and its scripting like like in a way where 
you know, when I play these games now, I'm not gonna say they're ruined, but I just kind of see behind it now. <laughs> you know, like I know all the systems that are in place. Yeah, you've been let behind the the black curtain, right? Right. Which I mean, sounds like it would ruin the game, but it's kind of the opposite to me. And and um, I want everyone to have the experience that I had in that project. Um, and so our long term vision, our long term dream is 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 that is is um, is is building a video game. Um, source repository that that can be accessed and studied um, in a way that's effective. Um, it's really difficult right now for a lot of reasons. Um, the first one, of course, being, you know, this is copyrighted material um, that is not for the most part being donated by its copyright holder. Uh, the second being that the video game industry sees source material, source code, um, as a trade secret, so they're not likely to donate anything interesting. Um, and uh, third, you know, the, the only way currently that's sort of legally airtight to access information like that is on site at a facility. And um, I took two months to learn that scripting language for Monkey Island. Like, like the, the idea of being in person at a library you know, doing that for two months, it just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, it, it's it's a long term vision of ours, but we do think it is the best way. Um, but uh, Kelsey, do, do you have an answer for that in a practical way? Well, like hang that? on, I want to I want to say <laughs> yeah. that you're missing a major number four, which is the technology uh, technological sure. um, issues that come with that, too, because a lot of this stuff was I mean, if we have source code, the best we can hope for is it's on like a floppy disk or a CD and hopefully that's readable. Right. Um, do you still have all of the tools that you will need to actually be able to read those files? You know, a lot of times it's in proprietary programs. It can sometimes be on much worse formats than a floppy disk or a CD. It can be on like a tape drive and um, all kinds of other other fun things. So there's a lot of technical hurdles for it too. Um, gosh, a more practical thing. I mean, I, so I, I have just recently wrote a book um, all about a uh, about Animal Crossing, the original Animal Crossing, um, and my strategy for that was um, obviously to go back and play the game a little bit, um, but then to just start trying to find the people um, who worked on this game, read any interviews that have been given. Um, you know, look for reviews of the game. I mean, it's really, it's a, it's a very like wide net of contextual materials. Um, I think that speaking to, you know, not just sort of the uh, creators of any given game, but um, other people who worked on a project. I mean, it really depends on how deep you want to go. Like if you, if you just want to learn a, a little bit more about a game, a lot of times there is an interview or two floating around that you can just read, get a little bit more context. Um, if you're trying to go really deep and create, you know, a documentary or a book or something like that, um, my suggestion is to not just try to go for the sort of obvious, like, you know, this is the person who had the idea for the game, but, um, you know, what about the, what about the guy who like did their social media? What about, um, you know, the reviewers who who were talking about it? What about, um, you know, one of the people I spoke to for my book. Uh, made the website for the original Animal Crossing. And um, I'm going to be speaking to someone next week who made the logo. Um, <laughs> so I mean, just it's a very, there's a lot of kind of weird strands you can follow and you never really know um, who is going to have an insight on the game because um, the people who, the people who created the game, you know, is not just idea guy and coder you know like it's it's a whole web of people who all um are part of a game story i mean to add to that too even if we're talking about the people who created them like maybe you don't start at the top you know like like uh, uh for example uh i'm doing research right now into the making of sonic the hedgehog 2 and uh i don't have access to yuji naka in japan the lead programmer but i do know someone who did art and lives local to me and like you know the insight that he's giving me is stuff that even naka wouldn't know so you know like don't don't feel like the only holder of knowledge is 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 the famous person on, on a game you know like a lot of people tend to work on games and some of them know where the the skeletons are hid 
and and also yeah. just the and community. I was going to say this is very exciting for for us too, Kelsey and Frank, because these are exactly the things I've been telling my students in class, right? Like these are the sources that we have to go to, especially because, and you highlight this on your website, right? Like there's actually not a lot of great published material out there mm -hmm. about the history of games at all, and so they're doing a lot of this work right now, just like you are, and especially with you, Kelsey, with your your boss fight book about Animal Crossing that's coming out. That's really important work. But sorry to to jump in there. Okay. No, no, that, that's great. Um, I'm going to just give a very general interview tip because it's my favorite one and it always gets me good results. So just if, if you are, um, for any historians that are, um, you know, starting to dip your toes into, into interviewing sources, uh, my favorite question to ask people to set them back in a time, because, you know, a lot of times you're asking people about memories that are 20 plus years old and like it, time fades a lot of things. Um, ask them where they got lunch. Ask them where they went to lunch you know, when they were working at that studio or whatever. And that that usually does a very good job at setting them back in that time period and, and kind of, I don't know, the memories come back at that point. I don't know why it works, but it's a, another it's a, one that, that, that I've heard and I've only used once, but I, I might use again is if it's in person, um, ask them to sort of sketch out the layout of the office and where they sat. Yeah. <laughs> like that that one also tends to be a magic trick that just like accesses the right neural pathways to get them back in that time it's it, those are th these are these are both really good tips please steal them we stole them we stole both yeah. of them i did we not come, them, i didn't yeah. come up no, with that great. one he the, didn't come up with that one, so. <laughs> these are good techniques that we we train young historians on when it comes to oral history more generally right and and how the, yeah. the mind works but um, we probably have time for maybe two or three more questions. Um, sure. the, the next question that I want to go for actually is, you know, kind of linked with some of what you're saying, right? The importance of private collectors to the kind of work that you're doing. But, you know, this question is, you know, do you think there's any hope actually as the video game industry is evolving and changing for the companies themselves to start helping? Or do you think it's always going to be that issue of monetization and trade secrets that are going to get in the way? Or do you think that maybe there is an opportunity for us to be aspirational and think that these companies, you know, can have their own archivists and be thinking about these these questions longer term. Let me start this one, and then yeah. uh, you'll have a ton to jump in with, I'm sure. Um, so, the, the good and bad of the modern video game industry, in my opinion, is that um, for most of the industry's existence, um, software has been made. Uh, by many mostly independent companies. And while that's still mostly true, uh, I feel like at least when it comes to larger scale, larger production games, um, everyone's buying everyone now. Like we're, we're becoming sort of a Hollywood studio system where there's like three to five major companies that own practically everything. Um, and, 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 and that sucks for a lot of reasons for people who make games, but 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 what it might be helping with, honestly, is keeping stuff around because what we've found is the enemy of uh, preservation of game development material is studio closures, office moves, things like that. Um, whereas like these larger companies that have been around forever, they tend to still have things going back to the 80s. Um, I, I do have good news as well for for the, the 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 asker, which is that we are starting to see actual archivists in studios, and and it actually goes back even longer than you think. Um, Electronic Arts, for example, has an archive team, not a person, a team uh, that that archives all of their game development work, and and. Uh, it, it, we've we've talked to other studios with similar things. There's a lot of archiving for like lore when it comes to lore heavy games but but also there's archiving for for the actual uh, material and assets and stuff and um the reason that that happened again in our opinion is because we now live in a time where remastering a game for better hardware later down the line is like expected um we in the industry we kind of had the same problem that i think hollywood did which is that um, in Hollywood's earliest days, there was no notion of once we sell this movie, there's another way to sell it later, right? Like when when the film industry began, you made a film, you sold it to theaters, and that was it. Like like home video didn't exist, streaming didn't exist, the television didn't exist yet, um, and so there was no reason to hold on to movies, so they didn't, and that's why most of early cinema is gone. We feel the same way about video games. Luckily, 
most video games were home media and self-contained, but the actual source material, you know, if people were making a game on on the Super Nintendo or whatever, they didn't tend to go like, all right, let's hold on to this because, uh, you know, we're, we we should remaster this game in two generations. It was, it was a fairly rare practice for a really long time. Um, so that that's the good news for like internal at studios are they archiving stuff yes um how do we transition from that into historians using that stuff i don't know it's kind of those like you know step one step two step three question mark step four like success right but but um but i think that just the material existing is is like step one no matter what um and so i i have high hopes that you know it might not be as simple as like you know, uh, Microsoft donates the source material of every game that, that that they own to libraries. Like, I don't think it's going to be that simple, but I think it will. It's a lot easier to. Um, it's a lot easier to ask for things that already exist as opposed to ask for things that need to go be found. Yeah, and and just to add to that, I mean, I think part of the reason that it's so difficult um, and that is improving is that, you know, companies are very afraid of like their secret sauce kind of, you know, the game industry is a very secretive industry. You know, you don't want to uh, let people peek behind the curtain. You don't want to give away the secret sauce. Um, it's very much trade secret. Um, and we're starting to see, you know, steps into that not being quite so scary. And I think if we can start convincing game companies that not only is it not super scary to let people see some of this stuff, but actually it's it's loved and appreciated and considered a good thing um, by the people that they're selling stuff to, um, that we will see some progress on that. I mean, we um, I don't know if anyone saw the insane 20 something part Double Fine documentary that was very behind the scenes. I think that's a, a very extreme version of, um, you know, peek behind the curtain. Um, Frank's been involved with several games um, uh, by Digital Eclipse, which have um, included a lot of like, you know, early concept art and kind of like these museum e sections of um, content that was never in the original games, but kind of provides like contextual stuff so that you can learn more about them. Um, and these are things that are being received really well by people, you know, that are um, that are exciting people. And I think just, you know, the more we can kind of hammer home to um, game companies and stuff that this is not only not scary, but also it's loved, um, then we can get further and further with that. Yeah, and I, I've talked with the students actually about, you know, some of that digital eclipse work that you mentioned too, as, as being really the future in a lot of cases, I think, of what, you know, sort of game documentaries and that preservation process of, of history might look like. So I'm really, really glad you brought that up, Kelsey. Um, that means the a next lot question. to me personally oh. as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's incredible work, Frank, you know, like, and I mean, in general, the, the work that the Video Game History Foundation and, and groups like like you are, are doing, you know, we need more of it and and they need support everyone, right? And that especially comes with not just, you know, thinking about rare things that you have, but more specifically financial donations, right, to make this possible so that it isn't just have to be a team of volunteers doing this work. Um, so the next question I have is, um, has a company or or a private collector ever requested or demanded something returned to them from from you guys? Like I think we we know some of the maybe wider, better known you know stories where where something might have been stolen, right? But but did you have this happen with anything that ended up in the the VGHF uh, collection or or not? I have never in my twenty plus years of doing this ever had anyone complain. Um and and. Uh, you know in fact the opposite in a lot of cases like we've we've sort of taken the risk on putting something online without permission just because we had a hard time even getting to people but once they found out they were thrilled um so no but that said you know we we don't play with fire you know like we we don't tend to deal with objects that are maybe uh, too stolen or too recent, you know, like we, we, we don't host things that were like, uh, you know, heisted in, in like a security breach, things like that, you know, like we, we tend to play it safe for the most part. And um, I, I think one of the, the secrets that everyone in the archives world knows that we don't like necessarily say out loud uh is that we're all bending the rules because you have to because there's literally no other way uh to get the work done um and so 
you know, we, we have bent the rules a few times, but we don't do it stupidly. We, we play we, we play it intelligently. And so we haven't done we haven't done anything to piss anyone off yet, like, so, so, as far as we know. Uh, so no, yeah. that, that that's not happened to us yet. But I'm, I'm trying to think like because it was also private collectors demanding things. I don't think that's happened to us. I don't. Though. I don't think so, but also we fairly early have, you know, started asking for, you know, like we, we actually make people sign things if they're donating something that mm -hmm. we think is at any risk of being asked for back. Um, As any and, good archivist should, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and and like... We did have to learn that lesson for what it's worth. Like, yeah, and, and it's not like true. to be sneaky or anything either. It, yeah. um, it's just more to... with it's, it's the relationship with the donor is, you know, just making sure that they understand what this is being used for, what they're donating it for, um, you know, what the expectations are. And, I mean, if they don't agree to it, then that's, you know, that, that's obviously a large bummer for history, but, like, I'm also not trying to steal things from people either. So, um, yeah, we, we really try to um, hammer all of that out before anything reaches us. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think this will probably be the last question um, that we'll we'll take from the audience, although it is kind of a, a big one, right? Which is thinking about the future, right? Um, you know, with the increased popularity of server-based games, but I, you know, we think about live service games more generally, right? Um, like uh, Valorant or Overwatch or you know Destiny, these types of games, right? Uh, how are games like that going to be preserved when a large part of the game depends on the live player base, right? When we're thinking about the culture that develops around the video game industry, what what do you think about that? I can I can start this one because I love yeah. answering this one. Yeah, um, I know so, you do. That's why I was letting you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I I do think that there there needs to be some rethinking of what it means to preserve a video game as we go forward. We've been very fortunate in this industry um, for a very long time that games came on cartridges or on discs. I mean, you had the entire game experience in one in one thing, um, and you know, that's not the reality that we're living in anymore. Um, a lot of games are live service, are server-based. Um, and even if you have the the technology and the ability to preserve, um, you know, to keep a, spin up a server and keep something running and everything, um, you're still not going to be getting everything that you would be needing to get out of that game. So um, if 50 years from now, you can still play you know, it, WoW Classic or whatever, World of Warcraft, um, like a you can spin up a server and make it um, playable. If you go into there and you walk around in this empty Azeroth, in this empty World of Warcraft thing, you are not really playing World of Warcraft. You know, you're not really playing it um, in the way that the people who were playing it at the height of its popularity were playing it. So um, rather than thinking about it as just a video game to preserve, um, you know, you need to really think about kind of the cultural impact and the things that happened within that game. So, um, you know, things like that YouTube video of Leroy Jenkins are going to be 20 times more important to a historian down the line um, than the ability to literally control a player character in that space. You know, videos about the game, articles about the game, oral histories, you know, um, seeing photos and videos of, of people playing that game at its peak and, and its impact um, are going to be a lot more important to a historian than just the ability to play a game. So, um, you know, it requires kind of rewiring. Um, it's it's obviously natural to think of like the most important part of uh, preserving a video game is the ability to play it. But I, I think we need to rewire ourselves a little bit and think about, um, you know, the most important thing is representing it. Um, and that could be partially playing it, but it's also um, all of the other things that went into it. I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think pursuing playability of, of server side games is is a noble thing to do. Um, and I, I just don't know that, you know, the the effort of of uh, all of the things that would go into making games run like that um, versus, you know, the effort of, you know, like you're saying, sort of capturing Twitch streams of games as they're live and stuff like that. Like, I, I actually just I don't know. We often think of like, okay, 50 years from now, what does someone need, right? Like, what does an historian need? And 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 I think it is like to to have the experience of of 
playing a game in its time colored for them as opposed to um, simulating it. Um, so I agree with that, but I also want to say that that our notion of like, well, maybe the source material should be accessible to to researchers um, is also in part a way of addressing that because um, you know to the to the question asker's point, it's like this is not like a game that you can just capture off of a CD or whatever, and the complete experience is there. Um, so the only way to even theoretically make it work correctly in the future, uh, or at least poke at how it worked systematically would be, you know, with its source material. And and um, so that's another way that we hope it gets addressed in the future. But again, it's, we're so early days and, and even the concept of libraries hosting source code that, that there's not a lot to talk about yet. Great. Well, thank you very much to both Kelsey, Frank, and the important work that the Video Game History Foundation is doing. Um, today's talk was part of an ongoing series related to video games and the depiction of the past in games and is representative of the growth of game studies at Columbus State University. We hope that this will be the first of many events that you will consider joining us for over this year and the coming years, and we welcome inquiries from any audience members who may be interested in learning more about these aspects of game studies going forward. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you for our next event where I will actually be giving a talk on my current book and research project entitled The History in Video Games, How Modern Media Reinvigorates and Reframes the Past. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.